Okay, if you can hear me, uh, just type your location so we can do a shout out of your name. Just type your location in the chat box. And in fact, if, you, if you're first time on, on Zoom, we have two places for you to type in. So for the first one is the- Okay, if you can hear me, uh, just type your location so we can do a shout out of your name. Just type your... Okay, we are good on. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay, good. We are looking at the chat now. Uh, yeah. Thanks, uh, David from KK. Come from PJ. How are you doing today? <laughs> uh, <laughs> my Google Home device. Uh, Bara from Penang. Stanley from KL. Running Android 8.0 and up. You can't use your voice to unlock your device. Google. Hey, Google, stop. Uh, <laughs> it's a third party. Uh, Chai from KL. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes it, I don't know, if misheard me saying Google or something, then you start responding. Kim from PJ, uh, Mozani from KL. Oh, thank you, everybody. So just, just give me one more minute. I'm gonna post this on Facebook really quick. Uh, Okay, we are good to go. Okay, thank you guys. Thank, thanks thanks, uh, for your patience. So today uh, we, we're gonna get right into the content. Like um, the topic of today is how to interpret the financial results of bank stock. So basically we all have Ian here. Ian's my partner in the dividend vault. And also you have seen him many times uh, hosting webinar on my behalf as well. So uh, he's gonna share with you how he actually uh, go through uh, analysis of a stock, uh, which is a banking stock. And uh, we will see what is the multiple sources of income that is generated by bank. And we will look at some of the ratios and the valuation ratios of the bank stock so that you can also do the same uh, when you are analyzing any bank stock on your own. So without further ado, uh, we have Ian. Hello, hey. Ian. Hey, Casey. Hello. Hey guys, thank you so much for having me here once again. It's such a privilege and honor to be on this uh, platform, in-house platform to actually share a little bit about my investment journey with you guys. And for today, I have actually prepared a lot of materials. So I think we just get right into it. So let me just share screen. Okay, I believe that you are now seeing my, my screen, right? My slides. So in this one hour session, it's gonna be very content heavy, where I'm gonna talk about interpreting financial results of a bank stock. Now, before I begin, right, so let me just do a short disclaimer. Um, so here we go. So there's a disclaimer. And uh, of course, whatever I'm gonna to present today is mainly for general information purposes. Lah. And uh, it's actually provided, I try to actually prepare all of this information on an SE basis. On, with actual information, but um, I wouldn't actually give you any representations or warranties of any kind. Lah. And uh, of course, if you happen to, um, if you happen to actually use this information to, to trade or to invest, uh, then uh, of course, these are actually not advisors from me. Uh, you are actually solely responsible for your own trading and investment actions. Lah. Okay. So over here also, we will not accept any uh, liability for any sort of uh, losses or directly or indirectly incurred during these trading activities, especially if you use our information uh, from uh, this presentation and also from kc.com. But the good news is this, like, of course, if you are actually making money from it, then both Casey and I and myself, we will not actually take any single uh, sort of a commission from it. So which means 100% of the profits you will keep but also you will bear 100% of the loss. All right, so this is actually the general disclaimers and I believe that all of you are agreeable to it. So let's just get right into it. Okay, 
So for me, right, the first thing that I would like to highlight to you guys is this, all right? So when it comes to investment, right, so I like to use a framework, all right, because it keeps things into perspective, like what is the game plan? And this is very important, especially in these times like COVID-19 or 2020. Actually, it's in any sort of economic conditions, both good and bad. Lah. But so happened that today, as we are doing this webinar, we are in, in a very unprecedented, challenging times. Lah. Especially right now, I'm not too sure KC is or not. Right? So, uh, Selangor, Selangor, PJ, Subang Jaya, we are all under CMCO right now. Okay? So during these, during these times of uncertainty, how do we actually invest with confidence, right? It's basically to have a framework like this, all right? To have a game plan so that you can actually navigate through the, the storms, all right? Especially when it comes to investments. So over here, right, uh, my framework will consist of four things, all right? So on the left-hand side, we have profitability and stability. So, profit so profitability, right? What I would like to do is to assess all right, I like to see a stock where it has delivered long-term track record of profits. All right, so this is very important to me. And uh, usually the, the duration that I will actually use is 10 years because it's a, time, it's a test of stability. It's also a test of resilience. So the first one is profitability. The second one is stability. Ah, stability is now very important, especially right now, all right, challenging times. So right now, right, we want to see whether or not a stock is actually uh, financially stable and it can actually ride out through the crisis. In fact, right now, a combination of crises, like the economic crisis, political crisis, and as well as the pandemic crisis. So stability in right now is a very important thing when it comes to investing. So on the left-hand side, we have, um, we have the quality, all right? Fundamental quality kind of uh, framework, kind of a criteria, okay? The first two is about the quality of the stock. And then we have the right-hand side, which is about the valuation. So the first one is actually valuation itself, where we are going to talk about PE and PB ratio. And uh, the bottom half, the bottom right corner would be yield because I'm a dividend investor. So dividend yield is actually something that I do consider. Lah. All right. So we have four things in mind, profitability, stability, valuation, and yield. So stability, valuation, and yield is actually pretty much simple, but for now, all right, the weightage, because it's a banking stock, right? Most of the weightage, right? Uh, the content, the bulk of the content will be, will be spent on the profitability of the bank. Okay, so let's take that in mind. So we are going to use this framework to actually assess one bank. And for today, I'm going to present to you a case study, which is known as OCBC, Overseas Chinese Banking Corporation. So last time in my... Last few webinars, uh, I talk about DBS in brief, but today we're gonna dive straight into OCBC, all right? Because it's a mammoth kind of a banking stock. And uh, I believe that it's worthwhile. If, let, if let's say you are not so much into reading their annual report, then uh, you can take this one hour and uh, you know spend one hour with me and I'll tell you whatever, as much as I can about OCBC Bank, all right? And of course, if you have any questions in mind, just put it in the in any box and both Casey and I, we will love to actually address it. So today we're going to do OCBC Bank and let's get right into it. So OCBC Bank, right, it's uh, one of the longest, it's actually the longest established banking group in Singapore where uh, last time I talked about DBS. So DBS is the largest financial service group or banking group in Southeast Asia and OCBC is number two. Number three is UOB. And after these three, right, then only we have the May banks, the public banks and stuff like that. Currently, it's given a credit rating of AA1 from Moody's. And this is actually one of the highest rated in the world today. And currently, it derives income from these key markets. Number one, Singapore, which constitutes about 50%, 50 to 55% of the, of the bank's profits. All right. Greater China is about 20%. So this will include... Um, mainland China and as well as Hong Kong and Macau. And then finally, we have a split of uh, Malaysia is Malaysia is a bit more, all right, sub 10 plus percent. And then Indonesia is below 10 percent. Okay, so this is actually where, uh, where are the key markets of OCBC Bank. All right, so right now we are going to go through the framework where I'm going to talk about part one, 
Uh, part one is about the profitability of the bank. Okay, so in order to assess that, right, I'm going to make this really, really easy. Because if you go to the financial reports of a bank like OCBC Bank, it's going to be a little bit complicated and a bit overwhelming. All right, I used to be there before lah, because I used to, um, because I used to actually, uh, before I, I was very well versed with stocks, I go and download the annual report of Maybank and I do not know what I'm looking at. Today, of course, I'm a bit, I'm a lot more knowledgeable. So I'm going to just make it really, really simple. You just need to focus on these few things. And I'm very sure you can actually find out how you can actually assess the profitability of a bank. So let's get into it. So basically for OCBC Bank, right, the whole idea right, is to look into these six things. Very easy. Okay. Profitability of the bank. Um, how do you assess it? It's like this. Okay. First, we have, we separate. Huh? We first have total income. Okay. So total income means anything that is bringing in money in. Total income. And then we minus off the total expenses. Okay. And then we have, because OCBC Bank right, has a very powerful associate. Huh? Okay. It, has, it owns 20% of a very uh, very good bank in China, which is known as Bank of Ningbo, uh, Bank of Ningbo uh, Corporation Limited. Okay, so or we call it in short form Ningbo Bank. So Ningbo, okay, or in Chinese is Ningbo, all right, it's actually a city. It's, it's a city, all right, in somewhere um, you can actually Google out the map. So Ningbo is a city where right? this is actually a city commercial bank. And it's actually listed on the Shanghai Stock Exchange. So OCBC Bank will own 20% of this bank. Okay. So this is where we derive uh, its associate profits. And once we have the total income minus off the total expenses plus profits contributed by Ningbo Bank. And therefore we have its core net profits, which is its shareholders earnings. Okay. So now that is actually uh, the framework. All right, the formula to actually assess the profitability of the bank. So now we are going to talk about total income first. So total income, right, we need to actually break it down into two parts. All right, the first one is net interest income. So net interest income is income that is being derived from its lending activities. So bank lends money to people like mortgages, car loans and stuff like that. And it actually collects deposits from people. All right, people like you and me, we put money in the bank and, and they pay us interest. You knock that off, then we have net interest income. So that's step number one, okay? Uh, money from lending activities. Step number two is about wealth management income. Later, I'll explain what's that. So typically speaking, wealth management is a lot of things. Later, we are, I'm going to show you a lot of things at step number two, all right? Step number three is about cost control, where we will measure the, the bank's cost to income ratio. So this one, as long as it's stable, I think it's good enough. So cost to income ratio, right? The cost is like, for example, we pay for uh, bank staff. We pay for the, all the IT costs, the marketing costs, the rental costs, okay? All these kind, kind of costs, okay? So these are operational costs to the bank. As long as the bank can keep it, keep it stable, that's more than, that's actually very good. Step number four, this is the deal breaker. Okay, a lot of people, they couldn't tell the difference between all the banks, all right? Banks like, for example, in Malaysia, we have Public Bank, May Bank, and CMB Bank. A lot of people couldn't tell the difference between, hey, which one is a better bank? Public, CMB, or, or May Bank? One of the key criteria I look at is the non-performing loan ratio, the NPL ratio. What it means is this. NPL means, um, a high ratio means they have more... Uh, more amount of borrowers, right? All right, they, uh, they borrow money from the bank and they default or they just delay their payment, okay? Usually they default. Lah. So the higher the ratio, the more defaulters and therefore they will have higher impairment loss, okay? So this to me is a deal breaker, all right? You don't want a bank that has a very high low, imp a very high non-performing loan ratio. You want a bank that has a very low non-performing loan ratio. So that's step number four. Step number five, we will talk about Nimbo Bank. That one, I will do it later. And finally, if you have all the five steps, growth in net interest income, growth in wealth management income, um, 
good cost control, very low non-performing loan ratio, plus some profits from associates, you should have an increase, a continuous rise in, or a continuous growth in its shareholders' earnings for the past 10 years. So this is what we're gonna test about OCBC Bank. So let's get into the six steps really quickly. All right, so this is actually the breakdown of total income. So this is uh, total income for OCBC Bank. So in 2019, it has made 10.8 or 10.9 billion uh, Singapore dollars, 10.9 billion Singapore dollars in total income. And here's the breakdown of its sources of income. The first one is actually the 6.3 billion. So this one will come from its lending activities. All right, it's net interest income. So as we can see here, 58% of the income comes from its lending activities. 31% will come from its wealth management income. There are all kinds of wealth management income, but here I'm gonna just leave it to two, the two main ones. The first one, I think is a very well-known life insurance company. And guess what the life insurance company is? Any thoughts, Casey? Hello, Casey. Oh, sorry, muted my mic. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, yes, it's, the, it's also the same color, right? A lot of people uh, actually uh, guess it, right? It's GE, GE, GE. GE, GE, GE. Yeah, uh, GE Junwei, Ocean, VL. Yeah, you all got it right, GE. Yes, it's actually Great Eastern Life. So we're gonna do a little bit of Great Eastern Life over there. And then we have this powerful, and then we have asset management, okay? Asset management, right, is one of the, how I say, it's actually one of, one of the, what do you call, uh, the sources of passive income to OCBC Bank, okay? And uh, this one, we were actually gonna talk about the power of AUM, asset under management, okay? Every Singapore bank has it. I think every Malaysian bank also have it, but then a lot of people, but then I did a little bit of study on this asset under management. So what is it about? Later I'll show you, okay? And the wealth management income, right? In total, they have uh, generated $3.4 billion. And uh, this one will constitute about 31% of the total income of the bank. And finally, we have other income. So other income will comes from investment income like rental income, interest income, uh, dividend income, or even trading income. All right, they have uh, bank staff to actually do some trading stuff, okay? And this one, they will constitute 11%. So all in all, to me, the more important incomes are net interest income and wealth management income because these are more recurring in nature, okay? It's like you have mortgages, you take out a mortgage, all right, to buy a house. You are not going to pay interest for just one time only. You are going to pay it for many, many years down the road. So it's actually recurring income. Life insurance is also the same. You buy an insurance policy, you don't just pay for one year, you pay for many, many years to come. And even so for asset management, especially when you have asset under management, typically, typically speaking, if you have a portfolio size so big, right, you are gonna get uh, yearly fees, all kinds of investment fees right, on a recurring basis. So all these things are recurring income, which is something that is very attractive to me as a, as a dividend investor because I tend to look at stuff which actually contributes uh, recurring income to, to the shareholders. So the first step is to look at its net interest income. So as you can see, over the past 11 years, right, it has increased from $2.8 billion in uh, 2008 to $6.3 billion in 2019. Lah. And if you look at the graph, it looks very nice, or sweet, sweet all the way, sweet, sweet all the way. Lah. As you can see, it, it kind of like, goes one way, a uh, one direction upwards like this. So this is something that I like. And the compound annual growth rate for the past 11 years is 7.8%. So this is actually pretty good. And uh, why, why is that so? Okay, so if you want your net interest income to increase, right, you must have an increase in the interest bearing assets. So interest bearing assets will include two things. The first one is actually the, the loan portfolio. That means how much loans, how much advances, or how much finances they have actually dispersed out to its be to disperse out to its uh, borrowers. So as, so if you have more lending activities going out like this, then of course you're gonna get more interest income lah. 
And the second one is actually uh, OCBC's uh, bank deposits. So sometimes they, they have their own cash. They want to park it into some, uh, some other people's bank and they, can, and they can actually generate some interest income from it. Okay. So they will actually derive some interest income from their own bank deposits. Okay. So these two are interest bearing assets. And what we can see here is that the interest bearing assets has increased from 122.8 billion Singapore dollars to 357.4 billion Sing Singapore dollars. And the compound annual growth rate is 10.2%. Okay. So now here's a question. Now you may ask me this. So Ian, here it grows 10.2. All right. Net interest income grow at 7.8%. How come the net interest income grow a bit slower? Well, the answer is this, okay? So sometimes when you lend out money, there's interest rate, okay? And uh, interest rate, right? So over, it has been a trend for many banks. The interest rate kind of like dip a little bit, lah, okay? It has, the interest rate has been adjusted lower a bit. So therefore, it causes the net interest income to actually uh, grow a little bit slower that as compared to the growth in its um, interest-bearing assets or IBA, okay? So this IBA or interest-bearing assets has grown faster than the net interest income. But anyway, it's, it's still good news. Lah. As long as there's a CAGR for me to calculate, uh, the net interest income still grow at 7.8%, okay. Uh, that to me is a consistent growth. So that solves step number one, net interest income. Now, number two, we are going to look at uh, wealth management income. So in general, here's what I find. Here's what I found. The wealth management income for OCBC Bank right, has increased from 802 million Singapore dollars to 3.4 billion Singapore dollars in the past 11 years. So the to 14.02%, all right? And this is actually uh, contributed from two main sources. And we're going to look into that. So these are the main contributors to OCBC's wealth management income. So the first one is Bank of Singapore. The second one would be Great Eastern Holdings Limited, all right, a very well-known uh, insurance company. So this is uh, so this is actually the OCBC's uh, interest in let's say Singapore Bank of Singapore, hundred percent. So which means Bank of Singapore is actually a wholly owned subsidiary of OCBC Bank. And the activities include asset management, asset private, asset preservation, family offices, estate planning, investment services, and so on and so forth. And this bank is actually to serve all the rich men, okay, all the high net worth individual kind of customers, all right? So this is actually the, uh, how would I say, the financial services, right, being offered to all these rich men. So this is Bank of Singapore. And Great Eastern Holdings Limited is also a Singapore listed company. It's a public listed company in Singapore where OCBC owns 88% of the life insurance company. All right. So this is actually the two main contributors to OCBC's wealth management income. Now, if you look at Bank of Singapore, so here is what I've gathered when it comes to its asset under management. All right. It has increased from 32. Now it's not Singapore dollars, it's US dollars. 32 billion US dollars and has grown at a rate of 18% all the way up to 117 billion US dollars. Okay, so why is this significant? So if you know about, so let's say for example, asset under management, let's take for example, unit trust as an example, okay? So banks, they may want to establish uh, unit trust. Why? All right, and they get all the people, they get all the customers to come and invest in a unit trust, okay? So let's say they pull all the money into the unit trust. So the money being pulled into the fund is also known as asset under management, okay? So the banks or the mutual fund companies, what they will do is that they will earn money from a few places. Number one, they'll earn money from sales charges, okay? The sales charges that uh, that is being charged to the customer for putting, for putting money into the fund sales charges. The second one is the, the second one is the best one. The second one is as long as the money stays invested inside the bank, right? Or inside the mutual fund, right? Then they will get all the management fees on a recurring basis. All right. So let's say for example, typically the management fees, it ranges like, it depends on what kind of fund. 
Some, let's say, for example, a bond fund, maybe they will charge a bit lower at 0.5%. And maybe for an equity fund, it could, it could actually go up to 1% or 1.5%. So depending on what, what kind of fund and what is the fee structure, all right? So typically you can say that um, the management fee or the annual management fee for all these funds, right, would range somewhere between 0.5% to 1.5%. So why is this so significant? Simply because if let's say you have a, a bank, okay, or a, a fund where its size is 100 million, all right, 100 million, one unit trust fund, okay. So from that 100 million, right, 1% is $1 million, all right. So as long as the fund remains in existence for, let's say, for the next 10 years, the fund doesn't need to grow in size or go down in size. It will continue to actually generate $1 million in management fees, all right? So uh, this is actually called passive income. It's actually a source of passive income to the bank. And uh, the beauty about it is this kind, of, this kind of fund, right? If let's say, for example, it grows in value, then the management fee will actually go up. If let's say, the man, if let's say during COVID-19, right? Like some funds, they actually lose, lose some value, lah, all right? If they actually lose like, their value, but say from, let's say, for example, 100 million to, 90 million, you still get management fees from the 90 million. So it doesn't matter where the economy goes, go up or come down, the management fees, the income, right, is still pretty much there. And for OCBC Bank, the, the asset under management, right, has increased from 32 billion to 117 US dollars, 117 billion US dollars. So you take that figure in your times, the percentage, right, you will roughly know that that's a lot of money, lah, but in that's a lot of money in passive income to OCBC Bank, all right? And of course, not forgetting, after we have talked about the mutual fund, right? Now we talk about Great Eastern. So this is the profit, operating profits after tax, all right, for Great Eastern. It grew at a rate of 4%, increased from uh, half a billion, 501.5 million Singapore dollars to 659.8 uh, billion Singapore dollars. So for Great Eastern, right, the operating profits have been quite stable over the past uh, seven, eight years or so, okay? But of course, the actual profits, right, will really depend. The actual, the actual profits, right, will actually depend because it was actually quite influenced by, by several factors. Lah. One of the factors would be, you see, Great Eastern is like this, okay? Let's say, for example, I'm a policyholder of Great Eastern, okay? I buy insurance policies from them. So I will contribute money on a regular basis to Great Eastern. They will take the money, all right? And of course, they'll pay the agent, they'll pay the agents, they'll do the operation stuff. But most of this money, right, they'll go into some, they'll, they, this is money, right? All right, they will keep because uh, if let's say one day anything happens to me, then of course, they'll take the money. They will actually have to compensate me. So it's better for them to keep the money. It's actually not theirs. But what they can do with the money is that they can actually go and invest it into some other places. Like they can actually buy a bond or they can actually invest in the stocks, all right? So this is actually known as float, all right? This is what Warren Buffett says. It's actually, this is actually float money. And when it comes to this float money, right? All right, they have invested in bonds and equities. And for Great Eastern, right? They invest very heavily in these two. And uh, because of that, <clears throat> All right, sometimes the market can, fl can fluctuate, all right? And uh, because of that, it will actually influence the, the actual profits being reported for Great Eastern. So if the market is good, their investments actually, the, inv the value of their investments go up, then very good, okay? Uh, they will actually report higher profits. If let's say right, right now, like COVID-19, uh, some of their investments actually depreciated or they lost their value temporarily, right? Then for that particular year, maybe they will report lesser amount of profits lah, simply because there's a, there's a loss in value when it comes to its investments. So it is very, very, very much dependent, okay? But in terms of operating profits for Great Eastern, it has been quite stable. You can say it has grown from half a, half a billion Singapore dollars to 600 plus billion in, in uh, 2019. Okay, so now we have taken care of the two parts which is uh, the total, the net interest income, we take care already. It has actually grown up. It has actually gone up quite consistently. 
And then we have the, what you call, the wealth management income. It has also grown at a very consistent basis. So now we are going to look at step number three, which is the total expenses, okay? So when it comes to total expenses, right, uh, OCBC has spent about $5.6 billion in uh, total expenses, where most of the expenses, right, will come from its operating expenses, where it has staff costs, property and equipment related expenses, lah, okay? So this will constitute about 82% of the, of the total expenses. And then we have the expenses where for 2019, it recorded 890 million in uh, impairment losses. Okay, so all we need to do is just make sure that this non-performing loan ratio, right, is kept at, the, at a very reasonable, reasonably low level. And finally, this one, amortization of intangible assets. So this one is actually about 100 million. This one is not so significant, so we are not going to touch on this. So we are going to measure, we want to make sure that cost to income ratio is stable. Non-performing loan ratio is actually low and let's keep it there, right? So, so this is operating expenses. As you can see, it has increased the rate of 8.7%. Of course, the more businesses the banks, the banks do, the more, the more expenses it will incur when it comes to inspiration. All right. The typically, this is actually not as important keeping the costs to show as you can see OCBC Bank cost has been pretty pretty good. Um, it has maintained its cost to income ratio somewhere between 40 to 45 percent. Okay. So it doesn't go up to 50 over percent. It doesn't come down to 30 plus percent. So it's at 40 to 45 percent. Very good. So which means every hundred dollars in total income right OCBC Bank will spend somewhere between 40 to 45 dollars on their operating expenses. All right, leaving behind 55. Uh, so that means to say they have 55, 50 to 55 dollars, right? Where either it was it will be spent on either the the banks may lose it from impairment losses, which we are going to talk about later. Um actually, after you have deducted the impairment loss, right? Then that's called a bank's true profit, lah, operating profit. And so right now we are going to look at its uh, impairment loss. So this is how it looks like, OCBC's allowances of loan and other assets. So as you can see, we, we have a, a pattern like this, all right? It's increase in loans and impairments losses in 2016 and 17, and as well as 19, okay? So most of these losses, right? Um, if you want to really, really make a breakdown, right? Typically, they are, most of the Singapore banks, I think they lend to, uh, they also have some lending to the oil and gas industry, okay? But since 2016, they try to like trim down their, trim down their books, trim down their loan portfolio to the oil and, oil and gas support and services sector, right? Simply because these sectors are not doing so well. Lah. So they want to like reduce or cut down the, the amount of loans being dispersed to this sector, okay? And most of the impairment losses will come from this, okay? And this actually causes uh, the loan impairment losses in, in 2016, 17 to be, and as well as 19 to be a lot higher than ever before. But anyway, in total, the loan, here's how it looks like when it comes to non-performing loans ratio. So initially it has been kept below 1% until, until there's a weakness in the oil and gas sector where it has increased from below 1% to 1.3% to today 1.5% and it has been kept at 1.5% uh, for quite some time already, lah, all right, for the past three years. So without the, so from the OCBC slides, what I've gathered is also this, the, from the 1.5%, right, 0.8% will come from the oil and gas uh, segment. And then the remaining 0 0.7, 0 0.8%, right, will come from the rest of the sectors, like mortgages, car loans and stuff like that. Okay, so if, you, so if you want to be really objective about it, then you can separate it. One half is almost half of the load, the non-performing load ratio, right, will come from the oil and gas service uh, segments. Okay, so now we, go, now we are going to move into step number five, where we're going to talk about Ningbo Bank. So this is actually Ningbo Bank, where it owns 20% of the 
20% share in this bank. It's the first listed city commercial bank in China. And it's listed uh, on the Shanghai Stock Exchange in 2007. And uh, it, OCBC Bank has, be, has uh, made an investment into it. And they become an associate starting in uh, 30th September 2014. Currently, right, this Ningbo Bank is not known for many people. But the latest what I've gathered is this. All right. Let me just do this. This is a typo. So this is December 2019. Okay. So as you can see, in December 2019 itself, it has a total assets of 1.1, 1 1.51 trillion RMB. And if you convert it into Singapore dollars, it's 305.8 billion dollars. All right. So what about this. So I find that this Nimbo Bank, right, uh, based on the total assets, uh, it's still bigger than Maybank. Uh. So which means to say it's larger than, it's large, it's, uh, if let's say Nimbo Bank is a Malaysian bank, it will be the largest bank in Malaysia. So it's still bigger than Maybank, Public Bank, and all these banks. So it's a very big bank in China. Although in China, there's many more bigger banks, but that's the, that's the size uh, that uh, the size of business that Nimbo Bank has right now. And when it comes to its profits, it has been, it has been a pretty, pretty fruitful investment for OCBC Bank. So as you can see, the OCs, the profits for associates, right, which mainly, uh, which is mainly contributed by Nimbo Bank, right, has increased from 352 Singapore dollars in 2015 to 566 million Singapore dollars in 2019. So this is actually extra income to OCBC Bank, which is actually very, very helpful. So if you have an increase in net interest income, like I said, net interest income increase, wealth management income increase, you have a very stable cost to income ratio, which means stable cost control, and you can keep your non-performing loans ratio at a lower level, right? And also you have additional profits from, from uh, Ningbo Bank, right? You should have an increase, a consistent increase in net profits, all right? And when it comes to shareholders earnings, right, this is how it looks like for OCBC Bank. As you can see, it has increased its core net profits in 2008, where it has increased from 1.5 billion Singapore dollars to 5 billion Singapore, 1.5 to 5 billion in the, in the span of 11 years, where the compound annual growth rate is at 11.6% per annum. All right, so this is actually the kind of stock, if you ask me, right, uh, what kind of stock do I, how do I know whether this is a good stock or not? So one of the ways, right, the fastest way to actually find out whether or not this stock is something that I will invest, right, is by this, is sum up by this graph over here. Lah. As long as you can see the shareholders and grow up like this on a very, very consistent basis, then this is something that I will pretty much want to look at. Lah. Anything that is not looking like this graph, right, then most likely I will not invest in this company law. All right, if let's say the shareholders earnings is actually either it's flat or let's say it's going down right then, of course it's a big no-no lah. Or if let's say the shareholders earnings, got no shareholders earnings, but it is a shareholders loss right then, of course the company, I will tend to stand up, stay away from it lah. All right, so that is actually my take. All right, how do you find a good company? So when it comes to its checklist, right, as you can see, when it comes to profitability, net interest income, it has grown at a rate of 7.8%, wealth management income, 14%, cost to income, cost to income ratio maintained at 40 to 45%, non-performing loan ratio at as of first half 2020 is 1.6%. Half of it comes from the oil and gas service sector. Uh, profits from associates, uh, mainly from Nimbo Bank has grown. So therefore, core net profits attributed, attributed to shareholders have grown at a rate of 11.6%. So if you have a company that has been, that has a CAGR in revenues, profits for some other stocks, usually that's a very good sign to the stock already, all right? Usually these are, thing, these are stuff that value investors will love to look at and will love to include it into their portfolio. Talk about the just now we talk about the long term 
long term uh, profit the long term results for OCBC Bank. But this is but this year is very unprecedented. We have the COVID nineteen. So what happened in twenty twenty? So how does how does OCBC fare during this uh, times this challenging times like this? So as you can see, this is the first half the financial results for first half 2020 for OCBC Bank. So as you can see, uh, this is first half 2019 and this is first half 2020. So the total income, right, you can compare 4.5 billion, 4.6 billion. Actually it's both 4.6 billion. So it's kind of like it maintains, so it is okay. Operating expenses, he has maintained, that's okay. Associates mainly from Bank of Nimbo, it kind of like maintains, so this is actually, so these three figures are okay. Now, the only thing that is actually uh, that is being highlighted like impairment losses, allowances. Huh? So this one, it has actually ballooned from 360 million to $1.4 billion. And when it comes to profits from insurance business, like Great Eastern Life, like Great Eastern Holdings, right? Uh, it has actually dropped from 400 million to 268 million. So that's why I highlight them. So the OCBC's financial results, right? Uh, it has actually been impacted by these two factors. So therefore the net profits for, for the first half of 2020, right? Has kind of like dropped at a rate of 42% from first half 2019. So it's like, oh, it dropped 42%, uh, all right? And it actually mainly cost, cost by these two. So we are gonna look at, uh, so I'm gonna explain, uh, why is that so? Okay. So for allowances, right? <clears throat> so basically they have this, uh, they actually give out loans to this uh, oil trader. Lah, all right. And in the newspaper, it's, it no, it's known as Hing Leong, Hing Leong trader. Lah, and it actually went bust or something like that. So because of, so, and, and OCBC bank, and as well as many other banks, lah, it's not just OCBC bank, many banks also lend money to this to this oil trader known as Hing Leong, and they are now uh, having very difficult times, lah, okay? And because of that, there's impairment losses, and it actually drove, it has actually drove up the impairment loss for first half of 2020. So it's actually, this one is actually due to Hing Leong. And for Great Eastern, profits from insurance business, this one is, uh, I'm not too worried about this, simply because, right, let's put it this way. Um, if you remember, let's say, for example, we have MCO or the circuit breaker in uh, March 2020. And then it lasts throughout April 2020 and then May and so on and so forth. So during this period, there's a stock market crash. Okay. And Great Eastern Life, right? They have invested a lot of money in stocks. So when you have a worldwide stock market crash, right? Of course, they are, they are going to report a, a loss. All right. A loss value because there's a stock market crash because OCBC Bank if OCBC Bank owns uh, Great Eastern and Great Eastern right they have a big chunk of portfolio investment portfolios in stocks and if you look closely what I know is that because from Malaysian stocks side like, they will report who are the largest shareholders okay the largest shareholders in these public listed companies and you will find that Great Eastern right uh, appears in these places like for example public bank they are one of the top they are i think they are one of the top uh top 10 shareholders of public bank may bank cmb bank petronas gas nestle fnn etc etc and even Carlsberg and heineken also they own they are the among the top 30 largest shareholders so when all these stocks actually drop right then of course they are going to report a loss in in market value lah, from all these from all these investments okay so this is actually a cost so i'm not too worried about that all right if the market recovers if let's say public bank continues to actually gain value and all this kind of stuff then of course they will report back the the, the appreciation the recovery in the in investment value in the future so this is the latest 12 months of uh, latest 12 months financial results for OCBC Bank. They made about 10.7 billion Singapore dollars in total income. Shareholders earnings about 3.8 billion. So the earnings per share is 86.8 cents as of now. 
Okay, so now we have actually taken care of the big chunk, which is the profitability of the bank. So now we are going to talk about the stability because right now we are dealing with in times of times like this, like COVID-19. So we want the bank to be stable, all right, financially stable so that they can ride out this crisis. So typically speaking, we are going to look at these three angles. The first one is funding. The second one is liquidity. The third one is capital, all right? So for funding, right, uh, OCBC sources of funding, right, will come from customer deposits, bank deposits. Okay, customer deposits are like, for example, our, our money, okay? The people's, the people's money, they put it in OCBC bank. Bank deposits, they can actually get it from other banks. Other banks may put some money in OCBC bank, so that's called bank deposits. Capital and reserve, Okay, so this one is shareholders' money. So if let's say I invest in OCBC Bank, then that is actually shareholders' money. And finally, we have debts. Okay, debts issued. So which means OCBC Bank they issue bonds, and then uh, or they or they get borrowings from other places, and then uh, to actually fund their business. So over here, I can say that OCBC's uh, funding right source of funding, eighty two percent of it will come from its customer deposits and bank deposits. I think less than 10% will come from its debt. So I think in terms of funding, right, they are not so reliant on, on debt, debt itself, but they are more, like most banks, they will rely a lot on customer's deposits, okay? So as long as customer continues to keep their money inside the bank, that's usually a very good sign. Now, when it comes to liquidity, liquidity simply means, right, if let's say there's a bank run, let's say people start to withdraw all the money from the bank, uh, can they actually tahan or not? Can they actually meet all these short-term financial obligations? So for the Monetary Authority of Singapore, which is something like the Bank Negara Malaysia, the Bank Negara Malaysia over there, so they set a regulatory liquidity coverage ratio of 100%. So as long as you hit 100%, it means that you should have a bank that is, that is a very very much they have the financial resources to overcome all these short-term acute uh, financial obligations. Lah. So for OCBC Bank, it hit 139%. So I think that is okay. Lah. It passed the minimum requirement by the MAS. So this is actually quite okay. And finally, we have total capital ratio. So, the, so this one is about capital. So this one is about uh, money to tahan the economic, the economic crisis and all this kind of stuff. So if you have a bank that, is, uh, that has high total capital ratio, it's, it's supposed to mean that the bank has the money to actually weather the economic crisis and all this kind of stuff. So the, min the minimum requirement is 10%, but OCBC has 16.4%. And uh, typically for most Malaysian and Singapore banks, like, we don't have much issues when it comes to total capital ratio. Uh, usually these ratios are quite high for most banks because they have learned their lessons in the uh, 10 years ago in, in the global financial crisis. So most of the banks, they have, they will actually maintain a very high total capital ratio. So this one, no issues. Okay. So likewise, so this is actually a, a, a donut chart when it comes to sources of funding. So as you can see, 82% of it will come from uh, customer and bank deposits. Shareholders money will constitute about 12%. So it's like what I said lah. Only 6% or below 10% of the, of the sources of funding right, actually comes from debt itself, like, like bonds and stuff like that. So this is actually a breakdown of OCBC sources of funding. All right, so just now we talk about the, uh, the profitability and as well as the stability ratios of the bank. Right now we are gonna do some valuation. Now, here's, a, here's something I would like to review to you guys. Actually, this slide is not completed yet. All right, so now I would like you, you guys to actually participate in helping me to, com to complete these slides, lah, okay? So right now we are gonna look into valuation and use together, all right? So how do you actually assess this? So as you can see, these slides is not completed and uh, you guys are actually, if you are on the screen right now, joining, joining with me this webinar, right? We're gonna do this slide together, lah, okay? So I purposely leave it blank because we're going to do some maths. Lah. So if you have your smartphone, then you just uh, prepare it. Okay. Because we're going, do, we're going to do some maths. So the stock price, right? Um, let's look at the current stock price of OCBC Bank. Lah. Okay. 
So right now the current price of OCBC Bank is eight point six six lah, eight dollars and eight dollars and sixty six cents. Okay, so we have eight point six six. Okay, so now as you can see, all right, there are three calculations for current PE ratio. I'm not sure which one you give me a popularity contest lah, okay? On which of these PE ratios you will pack okay? Now this one it really depends on the angle. Now for example, you can let's look at this tree, yeah. So PE ratio right is actually price to earnings ratio, but the earnings how you want to choose is you can actually choose any of the three, all right? So later you you tell me lah which one you you will choose. The first one, you can take uh, the 2019 core EPS, the, 2000, the 2019 earnings per share figure. And the 2019's earnings per share figure is $1 and $1 and 12 cents or $1 and 12.7 cents, okay? So if you want to calculate the PE ratio, all right, all you need to do is just take 8.66 divided by the 2019's core PE ratio of 1.127. And you will have a PE ratio of 7.68. All right, so this is actually your first PE ratio, 7.68. And this core EP, this 2019 figure, because COVID-19 is still very new. So this is like the, you can say it is the actual earnings ability of OCBC Bank without COVID-19. So this is the first PE ratio, 7.68. The second PE ratio that you can calculate is, is a half-hearted thing. It is like, uh, because the, the latest 12 months figure, let me just go back to the slides. So as you can see here, we have the latest 12 months results from Q3 2019 to Q4 2019. So this part here is without COVID-19. Q1 2020 and Q2 2020, right, is with COVID-19, all right? So the, so the second half of 2019 is without COVID-19. The first half of 2020 is with COVID-19, all right? So therefore, if you take, you take a mixture of these two, right, where the earnings per share is 86.8 cents. So now we're gonna, which is over here, 86.8 cents. So what is the PE ratio over here? All right. So if you calculate 8.68, you divide it by, sorry, it's 8.66, so it's $8.66. Let's do it again, 8.66. You divide it with the latest 12 months earnings per share of 86 cents and 86.8 cents. So you will have a PE ratio of 9.98, which is very close to 10. And finally, we have the worst case scenario, the worst of the worst case scenario of, of uh, earnings per share, okay? Whereby you take the latest latest quarter, which is Q2 2020, this earnings per share of 16.6, you multiply by four quarters to make it, to annualize it to 12 months. All right, so if you take 0 0.166, so this, is this, so this is the earnings per share for Q2 2020, you times four quarters, and you have 0 0.664, okay? Now, if you want to calculate the PE ratio based on the worst case scenario, you will have 8.66 divided by 0 0.664. Therefore, you will have a PE ratio of 13.04. Okay, so this, is, so this is the three PE ratios that I've calculated. So maybe, Casey, perhaps we can do a poll whereby which of these three PE ratio, right, would you actually take as a, would you actually uh, prefer if you want to assess the valuation of OCBC Bank? Is it number one, just take the 2019 
EPS figure. Number two, the latest 12 months EPS figure where it has half of it is no COVID-19 and the second half of it has COVID-19. Or is it the third one, which is take the latest quarter and just analyze it by four months, eh, by four quarters, which has okay. the full impact of COVID-19. Okay, good. So so uh, let them type in ABC, I guess, right? A is the first one, 2019. So B will be the latest 12 months, the trailing 12 months earning per share. And C will be only using the latest quarter and times four, you analyze it. So type ABC as your choice. Mm -hmm. mm. So let's see the results. Huh? So we have Chai, A. Hey, so we have Chin who says A. Okay, Chin will go with the A, which is the no COVID-19 kind of thing. Chai is half half. Okay. And then we have Eric Ku, which is C. All right, which is the worst case scenario. All right. The worst case scenario. Uh analyze of quarter two 2020's uh earnings per share figures. David says the, the average of A and B which means you take 7.68 plus 9.98 and then you divide by two. So you should have a PE ratio of 8.5 or something like that. Okay, so we have C, A, C, C, B, B, C, C, B, 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 B. So mostly people would take a lot from C. One says D or it says first half of 2020 times two. Okay. So if you want to have D, right? Option D. So which means to say you're taking these two, 15.5 plus 16.6. 15.5 plus 16.6. So it's 32.1. With times two. So your earnings per share is 64.2. You take the latest price, which is 8.66, you divide by 0 0.642. So your PE ratio will be 13.49. Okay, so that is actually the PE ratio that you would take. Okay, so I think we have a poll already. So most people will, will not, very few people will go with A. La. And most people will go with B and C, okay? So thank you so much for your participation. All right, so we are going to continue. So let's continue to, to PB ratio. So when it comes to PB ratio, all right, I'm going to go with, I'm going to just quickly calculate. The current stock price is 8.66. The net asset value, the latest one is 10.53. So what we can do is that we take 8.66, we divide it by 10.53, and therefore your PB ratio is 0 0.82. So is that good or bad? Later we'll find out, okay? So we just keep it as, as it is, 0 0.82. And finally, we have the current dividend yields, okay? Now the current dividend yields, right? So there are also two calculations. Right, first I'm gonna give you the stock price, which is 8.66. So now there are two ways to calculate dividend yields. The first one is you take the 2019 dividend yield, um, the 2019 dividend per share, which is 53 cents. Okay, so we take 0 0.53. So this is the amount of dividends they pay out in uh, 2019. And then you divide it by 8.66. So therefore you have a dividend yield of 6.12%. Okay. Of course, this one is without COVID-19. All right. It's 2019 actual dividends paid out. But in July 2020, right, the Monetary Authority of Singapore, which is like the Bank of Government of Malaysia, has called on locally incorporated banks like TPS, OCBC, and UOB Bank um, to cap their total dividends per share for financial year 2020 at 60% of 2019. So what you do now is that we have to take this 6.12, 6.12, 6.12, 6.12, 6.12, 6.12, 6.12, 6.12, 6.12, 6.12, 6.12, 6.12, 6.12, 6.12, 6.12, 6.12, 6.12, 6.12, 
you can times 60%. So therefore, your new dividend yield for at least temporarily lah, for OCBC Bank will be 3.67%. Mm -hmm. So guys, maybe you can do another poll whereby which of these two figures right, do you think is more realistic for your assessment of OCBC Bank? Is it 6.12% which is based on 2019 figure or is it the cap? All right, the cap means to say it's not exactly OCBC Bank don't have the ability to pay the dividends, but they're just abiding by the, regu by the regulation, by the MAS and says that, you know what, cap it at 60%, conserve cash because it's COVID-19. So your expected maximum amount of dividend use is 3.67%. So which of the two figures would you go for? Is it 6% or is it the 3.7%? So let's do a poll and see. We have mixed response, right? Some people will say the 3%, some will say 6%. Mm. Wow. Okay, so interesting. So there's no clear cut, there's no clear cut answer. Lah. There's no clear winner of is it 6%? Should I take 6% or should I take should I take 3.67%? Okay. Some say it's average. Actually, it's very hard to do average of the two lah, because um is uh, how I say, because a cap is already a cap, lah, all right? So you just take the actual, uh, I mean to say, how do you, very hard to take the actual, uh, I mean to say, one is about the true ability of the, of the bank's ability to pay out the dividends. The other one is they follow the rules and cap it at 60% at maximum. So it's hard to, I don't think it's nice, it's uh, fair to just take the average of the two, lah, all right? So it's just either one of the either one of the two. But anyway, from the poll, I can see that it's actually quite, uh, quite you know, quite mixed lah, All right. But anyway, let's just actually put it into perspective. So let's say, for example, right now the stock price is eight point six six. And let's say, for example, I'm just giving you an example. Huh? You can actually use your own. You can use your own what you call uh judgment to actually judge this lah, okay so let's say for example you are the type of people who says okay lah, i'm gonna assess it based not based on covid19 because it's not to say covid19 will be there forever it's actually the actual earnings ability that i'm looking at so therefore you're looking at a pe ratio of 6.78 okay of course if you are choosing this and this, you can take the figures here and just put it into, you can take these figures of 9.98 or 13.04, right? And just put it here, all right? And do your own assessment. PB ratio is pretty straightforward, is 0 0.82. Dividend use, if let's say you are also the type who says actual is more important than the COVID-19 case of 6.12. If you disagree, you can just take the maximum of 3.67, right? And put it into the box, all right? Put it over here. So what you can see is that if you base it on the actual, right? Obviously your current PE ratio, right? Is actually even below the 12 years lowest because the 12 years lowest is 9.1, 9.1. So therefore, if you have a PE ratio of seven, obviously you're going to think that it's very undervalued, lah, all right? Because it's even lower than the 12 years lowest. How low can you go, right? If you look at PB ratio, of course, during these times, it's actually one of those times who you, where you can buy OCBC bank at below a PB ratio of one. So you can buy below book. And when it comes to dividend use, it's very subjective, okay? Because if, if you're basing it on 53 cents, which is the dividend dividends per share of 53 cents, then you can get it at 6.12%. But if you want to have the COVID-19 impact, right? of 3.67, you put it here 3.67, then of course you are gonna get a little bit, your dividend use will be a bit below average, lah, the 12 years average for now. So it's really, really dependent on whether or not how you see things already. So in this webinar, I'm gonna show, I've already shown you the calculations, the steps, but then it's up to you guys, all right, the audience on how you use these figures, right? To determine whether or not this OCBC bank, is it undervalued? Value value or is it overvalued, especially during these times? Okay. 
So if you put all the pieces together, right? So if you are basing it on solely on the actual ability of the bank to make money without the COVID-19 impact, right? So the PE ratio would be 7.68, which will be the lowest, which will also be the um, below its 12 year average of 11.5. PE ratio will be 0 0.82, which is below the 12 years average. And the dividend use of 6.12, obviously it's gonna be the highest in 12 years time in the, in the period of 12, 12 years. And you can only get it because obviously like because of COVID-19, uh, prices have dropped. So therefore this is actually the case law. So if you look at the stock price graph, right? So this is how it looks like. Lah. So OCBC Bank has actually been on a near term, right? Since uh, 2017, it has been trading at around 11 plus Singapore dollars. And it's also because of this, the, what do you call? the bank stock price right will drop to 865 law all right from 11 plus dollars to eight plus dollars today okay so how do you find it do you have any questions just actually forward it we are going to answer it right now and with that i would like to thank you for your time with me to for your one hour with me here to talk about ocbc bank so with that pass back the control to casey Yep, awesome. Uh, thanks, <laughs> thanks, uh, Ian, for sharing all this information about OCBC Bank. Mm -hmm. So, uh, before we get to that, we have uh, uh, if you have any question, you can use the Q and A box to type your question. Uh, we will do some Q and A probably like ten minutes. And before we get to that, uh, also uh, we are launching Dividend Vault where Ian put up all the uh, dividend stocks, mainly listed in Malaysia, Singapore, and Hong Kong. Because in these few countries, the listed company, when they pay out the dividend, there's no withholding tax. And since you are all, and we are all Malaysians uh, resident, except me, I'm not, <laughs> I will get, I will have to pay tax if I got dividend. But uh, if you guys get paid uh, dividend from all the property listed company, you don't get to pay tax on that income. So it's like tax free. So uh, that's why uh, I think dividend uh, investing is quite popular in Malaysia. So uh, due to the uh, the favorable uh, tax treatment. And uh, you can, uh, uh, this is why we put up the dividend vault where we help people, uh, actually Ian, who did all the research and put up all the case studies and he has a list of all the stocks that is paying dividends. And you can look at the list. We categorize it in into uh, a few categories. That is some are high dividend yield, some are medium and some are low. And you can look at those lists and then you can pick the stock from there and if, if the price is right for you, if the if you are confident with the business uh, sentiment that is going to do well in the future. So uh, personally, I think uh, banking uh, shouldn't be doing so bad. It could be due to the, I mean, during this COVID-19 time, uh, people might be worried about you know, uh, impairment loss, some loan might go into non-performing. And uh, after this period, uh, the bank will be back to usual since people will be you know, back to work and you'll still be making more money. And in, in fact, in Malaysia, I, I kind of like uh, really uh, uh, look at the how the bank is actually like, you know, foregoing their profit for the short term so they can keep the customer for the long term, which I think is, is good. You know? Some, a lot of banks are providing extended monitoring. If you apply for it, uh, most of you will get it. Okay, uh, let's get to some Q&A. Are you yep, ready for sure. that? Okay. Uh, okay. If you want to look at this review, uh, this replay, right? Kelvin is asking, this replay, we, we always have a replay of about one week. So normally it's put up on Facebook. So it just goes to my Facebook page, check my post. Uh, it will be there for one week before we take it down and archive for paid members at my kclaw.com webinar site. Okay, one question from Ocean. What is the most cost-effective way to invest in Singapore stock? Actually, I didn't really explore, but what I would say is this, like, I'm, I've been, I just said this before, like, I use Maybank Investment Bank. I still use it to today, all right? Um, where the stock side, um, every transaction I will be paying about 0.5%. 
uh, it depends how much you invest, lah. Okay. Uh, but the but the flat rate will be. I mean to say, if you don't, if you are not investing a lot of money, uh, you will pay a flat uh, transaction fee and a brokerage fee of uh thirty two Singapore dollars, lah. Okay. So that is actually uh. So which means to say, every time you go in, you buy, it's thirty two Singapore dollars. You you sell is also thirty two Singapore dollars, lah. So this is so this is actually the, uh, the only the the way that I'm the the method or the way the channel that I use to actually buy my Singapore stock. There there are a few ways to do this, uh, right? Uh, I think Ian, you you have gone through the way is is through the Malaysian, uh, brokers, who yeah. let you invest in uh, overseas stocks. So most of the brokers in Malaysia, yes, they give it. And, and the, there are good things because uh, your money is uh, technically is still you know, go through Malaysia. So all the estate planning and then uh, when you want to get the money back, it's, it's very easy. It's simple. And nobody going to ask you, right? Provide all the documents when you are like going to get money back from, back from other countries back to Malaysia. And some people, they will prefer to like, they go to Singapore and they open a bank account, open a trading account and they invest through the brokers there. And then also uh, some uh, big brokers, maybe from US, like in private brokers, you can also put your money in US and invest in Singapore or anywhere else. You can do that. But of course, there will be more uh, more uh, inconvenient way to, to set it up because you have to set up an account and then you have to move your money out of the country. So uh, generally, banks will ask you all for all the documents or they, they are afraid that you are going to do like money laundering, this kind of thing. So there are pros and cons. So whatever routes, I think we should go and try it, try both and see which one is the one you, you would prefer, right? Okay, uh, Kenny is asking the story about the Hin Leong, right? OC, OCBC uh, has an impairment on uh, the loan given to Hin Leong. So uh, is it solely by OCBC or a lot of other banks as well? Do, do you follow the story? Uh, a lot of banks as well, but then a lot of people, I mean, you say it depends, okay? Hinglong, yes, okay, it, it hits news because Hinglong itself is a big oil, tr oil trading company, oil trading firm in Singapore. Lah. But then the thing is that, uh, to me, what is more important is that OCBC's book, let me say the loan, the loans given to, to, OC, uh, to Hinglong, right, versus the entire interest bearing asset, right, it's actually quite minuscule. Lah. So I wouldn't say that Hinglong, even if they, so here's 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 the logic lah. Okay, so King Leong may King Leong maybe they borrow. It depends on how much they borrow. So let's. It's been the story has been there for quite some time lah. So let me just uh, let's see whether I can get the story yeah. King Leong. Okay. So this is Singapore oil trader King Leong. The star. Let's see. Loan. Loan default or something like that. See, okay, one of the bank is Singapore is CIB Group. Uh, it stays. It says here already, lah. Okay. Uh, but as to what extent? Um, let's see. Uh. I think I think no really since we we kind of pull the information out of our head. I guess these are just stories okay. you can you can always look at it uh, from Google. So we have they, that is where we source for our information as well, right? Yeah. So it's like okay, lot we have HSBC, DBS. Mm -hmm. All right. A lot of other there banks too. Twenty banks lah. Okay. See, so owes four billion to more than twenty banks. Oh, okay. Mm. So. That's Twenty banks. So it's like <laughs> we're in this together. <laughs> yeah, they're in this together. So, <laughs> so that's the thing, lah. Okay. Uh, next question. Should we want to know, like, uh, what about the exchange profit or loss area? Shouldn't it be considered in bank stock valuation? I think, Chutming, you uh, you say exchange profit or loss. Does it referring? Uh, are you referring to foreign? Exchange. I mean, your currency exchange, profit and loss. Uh, if if that's it, so uh, Ian, what what is your take on this? Oh, for me, okay, it's very simple. 
you just talk to any Singaporean, okay? All right, Malaysian, Malaysian investing in Singapore and Singaporean investing in Malaysia, all right? So if you ask a Singaporean to invest in a Malaysian stock, they say, hey, how about the currency risk? For them, it's, for them it can be real because they, for them, maybe they have more confidence in their currency as compared to the ringgit, okay? But from a Malaysian perspective, to take your money and invest in Singapore and your money is, and the investment is denominated in the SIN, SIN dollar. So if you have more confidence in the SIN dollar as compared to the Malaysian ringgit, right? You shouldn't have a, you shouldn't have a, what do you call, a concern about a currency risk, all right? Simply because you have more faith in the Singapore dollar than the, than the Malaysian ringgit. So like me, for example, uh, I would say I would have more faith in the Singapore dollar than the ringgit, all right? Uh, that's just my views, lah. Okay, because uh, <clears throat> um, not to say because of what, lah. Okay, of course everyone understands. Uh, it's just uh, you can say it's sentiment, but I think the Singapore government. Uh, yeah, uh, Chen Ming okay. uh, actually uh, further clarify yeah. that. Uh, he further clarify yeah. that. Uh, he he what he means is that uh, the bank uh holding other currency, hmm. foreign currency. Bank holding? I mean, OCBC, like bank. owning Ningbo Bank, you know, owning like uh, Great Eastern, which is uh, it also operate in Malaysia. So these are the foreign currency thing. Oh, okay. What do you think about that? Yeah. Oh, so that one, I don't think it's an issue. Uh, yeah. I don't think it's an issue because, uh, because all the accounts are actually reported in, in, Sing in Singapore dollar. So all the mm. information presented here is all based on Singapore dollar. So I don't think it's that. Of course, there's a currency risk and, and stuff like that, lah, all right? And of course, OCBC also operate in Indonesia. So there's a bit of a ru rupiah kind of a risk. Lah. So what if the rupiah drop a lot, right? Then of course, it will affect the bank's profit. Lah. But the thing is that that's not the main point of, the, that's not the main consideration of mm. to be lah, when I invest in OCBC. Because as long as, uh, okay, lah, maybe Indonesia is one thing. As long as they don't have a lot of things in Indonesia, then I'm actually pretty much okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I mean they, when they operate the business, let's say they operate business in, in Indonesia, they, they are taking the fund from, from Indonesia, right? Uh -huh. So um, the money will be like still Indonesia. So it's just day-to-day mm -hmm. -day operation. Um, yeah. I, I don't think it will be a big issue as well. I, I, I do agree with you. Hmm. So uh, Hong Leong... Hong Leong Ui uh, asking us when will we cover Malaysian bank stock? Uh, so I think you, you covered public bank before, right? And before this, you also covered UOB bank, right? No, I haven't covered UOB. Oh, uh, no, UOB? Oh, oh, what is that? I haven't covered <laughs> uh, UOB bank, uh, United Overseas Bank, uh, but that's uh, the third Singapore bank. Uh, yeah. which I haven't and covered. Malaysia one, you, you, had pub, uh, you had covered public bank, right? The only one. I believe so. Uh, yeah. uh, okay. Okay, one more question before we end this. Uh, for elderly people who invest in Singapore mm -hmm. shares, so if he unfortunately pass away, is it can the Malaysian Investment Bank help to get the shares transferred to their children? This is about estate planning. I guess you talk a lot with uh, Jocelyn. Do you know any information about this? Oh, actually, that's the thing. All right. So if you go through Maybank IB, right, then obviously you don't have that kind of issue. Right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Technically, your account is in Malaysia, right? So it will, according to your uh, estate planning in Malaysia, so you have a will, and uh, basically uh, you have to you know, present the grant of probate, go through the probate process, and uh, <laughs> bank will release, will release it. I mean, you know, just transfer it to whoever heirs you have in your will. And if it is in Singapore, then it will be a little bit complicated, more complicated because. Uh, you, your, your grant of probate in Malaysia might not work in Singapore and you have to do that in Singapore to get your assets in Singapore distributed. Yes, and that will be very, actually quite my fun now because mm -hmm. if you have something in Singapore, then obviously you're going to have it. Then you'll definitely need the help of Jocelyn, right? Jocelyn, she recover a lot of time. <laughs> she, she helped my client you know, do up the estate planning in both Singapore and Malaysia. And, and yeah. does, does she cover in Australia as well? Some people, no. Malaysian people, they, they like to own asset in Australia too. 
I think what she would say is this, like, if you have a brokerage account in Singapore, which means you also have a bank account in Singapore, then it's best. Then she would say, you know what? You have to have a wheel written in a Malaysia. A wheel in Singapore. And Singapore. Right. <laughs> Two wheels. <Okay>. Two wheels, <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Because you have to appeal for, you have to apply for the grant of probate in two different courts, two different countries. Yeah. Two different countries with two very le- two very different legal system. So if you don't want so much fun, right? Just go with Maybank IB. Lah. Yep, yep. In fact, awesome. the, just, a, just a small tip. Huh? Because if you want, why Maybank IB? Because when you collect dividends from, from all these Singapore stock, right? They will charge you a dividend handling fee. All right. So for Maybank, it's cheaper at $1.80. Ah, okay. So which means you, you receive $100 in dividends, then you will be charged one $1.80 but if you go with, let's say other banks it could be a lot more a lot more expensive lah. some could be even $10 so it's like very huge difference lah. $1.80 and $10 is a huge it's a very huge difference lah. so uh, when it comes to lowering your dividend handling fees go with Maybank IB lah. okay great thank you very much yep uh, yeah, we, we, we have done with this session. And uh, in fact, next week, we are going to have uh, the topic talking about retirement planning. So we'll have a, a licensed financial planner, Ms. Tan Hui Chi, will be back to talk about retirement planning. And if you want to get the invitation, as usual, get on my email list. That is the best way to get the announcement we send out every week when, whenever we have uh, a webinar lining up. Or you can follow my Facebook page and uh, you no know, check on it uh, often just to get the update if you want. Thank you so much. Thanks, uh, Ian, for sharing this information. Yeah, before we let you go, and, do, yeah, and, do you want to sh- do you want to talk a little bit about Dividend Vault? We're, uh, we're we launching uh, this week and it'll be ending soon in a few days. And you guys can get in at a discount right now. Uh, yeah, I mean to say, uh, of course, I'll be more than happy to actually uh, to have you guys as a subscriber. Um, it's actually basically a lot of work has been put into place lah, when it comes to Dividend Walk uh, because we are not just going to have uh, tutorial videos, but we are going to have a lot of, I've actually compiled all the dividend stocks and put it inside there. All right. And these are actually all handcrafted stuff. Lah, mm-hmm. And uh, it's all based on findings from all these annual reports. All right, all these annual reports from all these dividend stocks. Lah. So if you're so it's kind of like an a convenient thing lah, because you don't need to read so many things, right? So so yeah, you, you yeah. can uh, <laughs> you don't need to read so many things and you don't need to compile everything one by one. Everything has been compiled for you. We have the raw data for you. If you don't know about the raw data, we will teach you how to read the raw data. And if you want to have the and if you want to have the story behind the raw data, we also have the case studies with you. And if you are the type who don't like to read, never mind, we got presentation slides. All right, so that you can Which is kind everything. of a like summary, right? <laughs> very easy. All very colorful, very sub, all very colorful, very visual. So, uh, yeah. so yeah, and so it's actually an added convenience to you guys so that you can prepare yourself to become a very good uh, dividend-based investor who can start building a portfolio that pays you recurring dividend income. Of course, it's going to be a bit different from Bursa Method, like what's being asked. Because Bursa Method, I think, is more towards growth investing. And I believe that um, Peter will has his own flavor, his own style of teaching, um, his own philosophy of investing as compared to uh, dividend-based kind of stuff. All right. So it depends on which of the two you prefer. Lah. All right. I'm not too sure. Maybe Casey can actually tell us a little bit more about the difference between Bursar method and dividend. Yeah, in, in fact, I, I got this question a lot. I have, I have actually, uh, I'm, I'm actually selling three courses related to stocks from three different trainers. We have Ian here and then we have PC Wong who we'll talk solely about in uh, foreign shares only, all the overseas stocks. And then mm-hmm. dividend is, uh, and Ian is the guys who, who like dividends. So it's, mm-hmm. it's good for cash flow. So it's like if you are a retiree or if you're just getting started, you want the easy way to just invest and, and you will hardly lose money doing this way, Dividend Vault will be very uh, suitable for you. 
And then we have uh, uh, Peter. Peter is uh, one of a kind. He, he invests a lot in the stocks, like a lot, and he uses leverage. So it's very sophisticated. So you want to learn like all everything about stocks, about personal finance. I think uh, Peter is the guy you, you really want to learn from too. So uh, mm. all these courses uh, are different. And, and some people, they like the excitement of you know, always chatting about the stocks, uh, looking at different kind of sectors, different kind of trend. Then uh, PC Wong is the guy. He's always on the market. He read all these news. And you, if you like this kind of updates, then you can follow PC Wong. Definitely, uh, he's another style too. So these are all different uh, kind of things. And then, uh, in fact, I have... Uh, money back guarantee so you can always join this course take it up 30 days if it doesn't suit you always ask for refund i will give you back all your money and we will absorb all the transaction fees all the risk on us you will never get a risk for putting money on my course right that's what i'm going to say <laughs> it's not that the same so no risk investing is always risky investing <laughs> One more thing also, one thing that is actually very exciting, like that both Casey and I are doing for Dividend Ball is this. Like, we actually started to pay out some, we actually started to pay out this thing called the, the bonus dividends because we are actually putting up a dividend investing challenge yes. where, we, where we are rewarding people for, for investing in, uh, for building a dividend-based portfolio. All right. And we are giving out $300 in bonus dividends. Yeah. And to my surprise, like, hey, there are actually people who actually completed yeah, the that, that There are already a few people, uh, a few of the students who, who got it, right? They, uh, pay, they pay, what, 499 for the uh -huh. year, and then we, we, teach him, we teach them how to make money from dividend. And then they got paid the dividend, and then they claim another 300 from us, right? <laughs> so essentially, they pay, what, 199 for the whole year of uh, information, right? <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, I uh, do invite you to check it out and uh, see whether or not this is for you. Lah. And uh, okay, can I actually have one more minute just to address this comparison okay. between Malaysia banks and, and stuff like this. Okay, so a lot of people, okay, so from my perspective, Malaysian banks, Singapore banks got a bit of difference, all right? For most Malaysian banks, they are very much localized and for Singapore, it's a bit more regional more Asia Pacific, okay? Or more, more ASEAN, okay? So which means to say, if you want Malaysian bank, Malaysian banks is for, is based on the Malaysian economy, but for Singapore banks, right, you get the exposure of, let's say China, which is a high, which in the world today, right, which country has a good GDP growth rate? All right, so it's actually coming from that part of the world, China and stuff like that. So if you want to have exposure to China, then of course, that is one of the places to be in. Uh. Unless you're talking about Hongyong Bank, where it has Bank of Chengdu, uh, all right? Chengdu Yinghang. That's the only exception. But otherwise, um, Singapore banks is actually quite regional in that sense. And another thing that I'd like to talk about is uh, technology, banking technology. So you compare the two, I, would, I, would, I believe that at the end of the day, you will find that Singapore banks, when it comes to banking technology, they are more advanced they're more prepared as compared to Malaysian banks. Lah. All right. So these are the two key things that I would like to add on to you guys that you may want to consider when you are choosing between a Malaysian bank and a Singapore bank. All right. One is about this geographical reach because Malaysian banks have lesser in that sense. Singapore has it. And number two is technology. Very important. Lah. So <laughs> it's because we are now living in the 21st century. So you want a bank which is very well equipped and prepared for, for the, uh, for the what they call, uh, for the twenty first century, mm. and of course, don't forget about the financial, re uh, financial results that I've just presented. You can actually do compare OCBC with the rest of the banks. All right, and all these things, if you are a dividend walk people, all right, uh, this is the tutorial, and of course, all the groundwork has been done. You just need to go and do line by line all the comparison, and you should know. What you want to what you want to do already with with these banking stocks? Now yeah. I leave it to you. Yep. Thank you very much. Thanks for attending, and we will talk to you again in the next webinar. All so right. I guess uh, Ian will be hosting uh, Miss Tan Wei Chi next week. So yeah. see you guys. I'll bye see bye. You guys.